Let's go. You guys ready? Yes. Oh, okay. So let's open up the meeting. Um, uh, is everybody happy with the the minutes? Why, no, I'm not. Dave did him. I thought he did a great job. Okay, what's the matter? <laughs> there are a couple misspellings. Our representative's name has an H at the end, and that's done twice. So you're consistent. No, the other one, Zachariah. Otherwise, it looks like Zachariah, so or Zacharia. So it's the kit, Zachariah, the H. That's it, Dave. That's that's okay. the extent of your complaint. Yeah, it's not actually that's a complaint. Not, uh, it's an observation. A, okay, that's good. Mm-hmm. Nope, that's it. <laughs> okay, that's good. <laughs> so, otherwise, everybody's good with the minutes. Yes, they're yeah. excellent. Yeah. Okay, no, it's approved. So, Dave, did you say you have something you want to add to the, to make an adjustment? <laughs> uh, at the end of the meeting, um, appropriations, discussing appropriations, and the fire department. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, I think you guys are I think we can move right on with the CATV thing. Yeah, so, let's see you're here. So, just lead the right ahead and. Uh, it's a little easier for me. Your... Do you hear this? Okay. All right. Sorry, you're going to see the back of my head. Hi, I'm Donna Giro. I'm the executive director of CATV Community Access Television. We're the local nonprofit TV station that serves five towns in this area. Um, we serve Norwich, Hartford, Heartland, and um, on the New Hampshire side, we serve Lebanon and uh, Hanover. And uh, the services we provide to each one of these towns is that we film government meetings, we air them on cable television, and then we also air that we live stream them on the internet, so whatever you see on cable, um, well, excuse me, that's not live streaming. Whatever you see on cable TV, you can also see on our website. So you don't have to be cable, uh, cable to have that, um, that feature. Um, also, we store these um, in both our video on demand archive on our website, and we also store them on archive.org. So if you wanted to see a meeting from four years ago, archive.org has our library. So all of that is labor intense. We do a lot of digital management, compression. We also um, teach for free any adult um, or, or child on a one-on-one -on -one basis um, about any sort of media skills that um, if we know how to do it, we're there for you. So people come into our studio all the time and set up time to have one-on-one -on -one training. We also um, have a lending library, so you can be trained in how to use equipment or you can be trained with just the daunting world of, of media management or whether you want to edit something. So we provide that at no cost to the community. Um, the thir third thing we do is a lending library of equipment. So if, let's say, you have something that you're passionate about and you want to have that filmed, um, we will lend you equipment at no cost. So those are the services that we provide to the Heartland residents. Um, we're, I'm here because uh, for the first time ever, we're asking Heartland for an appropriation. Um, originally, the reason why we're asking for an appropriation is because our funding stream is greatly threatened. Um, it costs about just under a half a million dollars a year to run a TV station locally. So it's like a, a good budget would be income coming in at about $475,000.
over the last couple of years, um, unusual threats have happened to that funding stream. We've always been a utility. The majority of our funding has come through, um, through franchise fees that filter through the cable companies and to us. And those franchise fees are to support the cable part of our business. Uh, we also provide internet because we know a lot of the a lot of the people in the community don't have cable, so it's an extra service we're providing um, based on the reality of how we need to communicate. So um, there's been multiple state and federal threats to our funding, so we find that as a utility we now have to start acting like a nonprofit, which is a very difficult thing to do to transition. You need friends, you need deep pockets, you need all kinds of uh, funding to be able to to even ask for money. So we're going to each town and saying, could you help us with some of the service that we provide to you? Um, we expected a, um, up to about $140,000 uh, loss this year. We're still unsure as to what that loss is actually going to be because there's so many threats, it's very difficult to gauge. So what we decided to do is as just ask each town for a small, um, amount of money that would help pay for just the videographer's um, expenses and some of the labor to compress and upload the, um, the documents. We're asking the town actually for $3,000. Originally our ask was, our petition is for $8,200, but we, since we're unsure of the funding threat for 2020, we backed off that amount, so the petition is at 8,200, and then I was told by the clerk that we could backpedal off that amount during the day of the, uh, in March, during, I don't know, do we call it town hall day? You what do we? It, uh, from the floor, or I was talking to the town clerk, the select board, maybe simply able to put it on, is it honorable at $3,000? Great. So if the, if the select board is amenable to the idea, I would reduce this amount to $3,000. Do we need 8,200? Yes, we do. Um, do we need probably more than that? Yes, we do. Um, it, costs, it takes about 450 hours of man hours to do just Heartland per year. So if you just figure out what minimum wage would be, you know, you're looking at probably about um, $8,400 just to do that part of it, the, the filming, the archiving, the compression. Um, and so when you start talking about equipment, et cetera, obviously the cost is much higher. So um, we've already asked Hartford and Norwich last year for this ask, and they voted, the, the, the town folk voted yes and we're now approaching Heartland as well. I just couldn't get to Heartland last year. How about Lebanon, because that's also a big player. It's funny, um, New Hampshire is very different, run very differently mm -hmm. than, um, than um, the Vermont side. So it's literally, instead of the funding going from the cable provider to me, the funding is going from the cable provider to each town who has the right to take all the money or to, I, I go each year and I actually ask for $135,000 from them. Mm -hmm. So they have that right to, um, Lebanon's actually doing the right thing. They're giving me the right percentage so that I can manage their business properly. So it's good. For the Vermont towns, it's coming direct to me divided by the three towns, okay. um, and uh, that funding is, is uh, diminished. It's very, very complicated. There's many reasons why the funding is wobbly. Um, some of it is the Vermont lawsuit that just happened. Comcast sued the, the Vermont Public Utilities Commission. We just settled. Um, we lost some things. We gained some things. Um, there's the FCC. There's a challenge from the cable companies to the FCC to monetize what the channel actually costs um, to rent. Uh, so that could be just a horrific amount of money. And if your town is actually receiving, let's say your library or your school system or your town hall is receiving discounts right now, courtesy discounts for cable and possibly internet, um, 
from this point forward, they have the right to charge for those things, but they're not going to charge you. That's going to come out of my franchise fees if you want a discount. That I need to confirm, but it seems almost insane to me. Sorry, I shouldn't have put that on. Um, so uh, there's lots of layers and lots of discoveries that are slowly rolling out. And in the interim, we ask for your support. Right. Well, Comcast is the big player in town, and they have both coaxial as well as fiber. Does that matter with, as far as the uh, your income from Comcast? What, what matters is actually how many cable subscribers and how big their package is. So if you have basic cable, yeah. there's a small percentage. If you have um, all the bells and whistles, there's more coming out of your bill. Okay. So it doesn't so, matter about the delivery mechanism. It's just the package. Yeah, okay. exactly. Um, I apologize for forgetting to bring the papers, which we, I had them last oh, two weeks ago, I guess, or something like that. But mm -hmm. I, I was really struck with um, the funding model that you use. It's, we're the same size town as Norwich, but if I recall, they have at least a third to a half more of your production hours uh, or content. I um, actually... And we're paying your, your about to bill us the same amount. Of the, of the number of hours? Well, I, I, when you, I, I, the chart that I, I you have. I believe you're mistaken. Handout, Let's see, Norwich, that 676. That's a shared amount with Hanover because they share the school system. So yes, they do have additional charges. Uh, yeah, I don't follow you. I know it's a Dresden school district. Right, the Dresden, so, we're, the so we, we, ch we sort of charge man hours half to Norwich and half to Hanover. So, um, yeah, it took us more, it took us more. Yeah, it's uh, quite a bit more. Yeah, it was about, a, was about 150 more hours. Models. Yeah, you know, it really, when we're estimating hours, it really depends on the town at, at the time. So if Heartland has an issue, and it takes many hours to resolve the issue, then we spend more, we spend more time and money. Yeah. So if a town is comfortable one year, uh, they have less, you know, less hours in each meeting. It's, um, right. It really depends on which town is in strife. Right. So we don't usually, we don't look at it. At, we, we basically, we have an overall budget and we're trying to fit everybody's needs in that budget. So it looks like for the overall budget, you've divided it by population rather than by? Yeah. No, we, we, for our budget, it's a big old lump. We okay. basically okay. try to serve five towns with their needs. Right. Um, I, I use the CATV to look up, and I just recently needed to do some research on past meetings, so I, I did use it. Um, do you have any, um, so I'm a supporter of it, but I'm just wondering how used is it by the general public? There's a good question. So it depends on, we, we put out a report each year that goes to the um, Public Utilities Commission, goes to different departments in um, New Hampshire and to the cable companies. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's also in our office. So we have all kinds of statistics that talk about usage, yeah. talk about we, we don't have the manpower to spend time just looking at website hits because we have no way to judge the cable side of it because Comcast will not, is proprietary information, they will not let us know how many people have been watching the, the cable. Um, we just know we have about 11,000 um, TV viewers. Okay. So really it comes down to, is there a problem with the, the town meeting? It could be 250 people watching it. It could be 600 people watching it. It could be 10 people watching it. Really is issue based when it comes to government meetings. But I can tell you that we just loaded this is sort of a, a, a tell for us. We were trying to reduce as many as expenses as possible this year. We're down a, an employee and a half. We're looking for a new location. We have stripped our budget as clean as possible in anticipation for these problems. We've done all our due diligence. And one of the things we did was move from Vimeo to YouTube so that just for community events. So we literally just moved our whole library over to YouTube. 
didn't do anything about it, didn't put tags on anything. So when you search, we won't come up. In the last year, there were 70,000 views without any effort on our part. And I think 70,000 people are watching our community events mm -hmm. in one year. So you know that at some point, at least the community pieces are well received. Yeah. Wow. That's with no effort, nothing, it's just organic. <clears throat> so do you have a spot you're gonna move to? Um, right now, Mine. fingers crossed, we might, but it has to be able to be accessible by uh, Comcast and VTEL, so I have conversations that need to happen. VTEL um, is here in Heartland, and uh, your town is supported by both Woodstock and CATV and uh, the Woodstock station. We have an agreement with the Woodstock station where any revenue we receive and franchise fees from um, VTEL, we split 50-50, so I send them half of it so that we can make sure that both stations survive. So it's a small amount, it's not, it's not the bulk of uh, the community. So, so you, you could relocate to somewhere in Heartland? Is that what you're saying or not? Um, I can relocate wherever someone will give me really cheap rent that's cable ready and internet ready. <laughs> so, so that's the... That's the goal, is I'm trying to have the cost of my rent. But um, Hanover offered us a location, but would, it would cost me about $40,000 to cable to that location. Uh, but they were offering it at free rent. So um, I am considering, I'm turning over every rock. We basically need a long-term solution for CATV because all public access in America is being threatened right now, and we think it's we think we're foundational to community connections. Yeah, I do too. So Hanover's good though. Hanover and Lebanon? Um, Hanover. Uh, <laughs> I didn't hear you say. Uh, Hanover um, was underpaying us for a few years, and when I started as executive director, I basically said, guys, you need to, um, you need to, um, increase the amount of money that you provide to us for the services we're providing to you. And so they uh, created a plan where they are incrementally raising at $5,000 each year and until we hit the, the desired amount. And that's one of the reasons why they were hoping to locate us there, because I think they realized that they have done us a disservice for a few years. And the only other question I have is, why, I mean, how is it okay to ignore all of the other towns? Ignore all of the other towns? Yeah. I'm sorry. Pomfret. Oh, it's not a matter, it's a physical, it's a, yeah, it's a physical environment. I, um, if Comcast doesn't cable, I can't air. If there's no internet or no cable, I can't air the, so, so what I've asked two years ago, I asked Comcast, um, if you decide to cable those areas, I would like right of first refusal. I would like to serve those towns, sort of like a real estate deal. And so if they decide to cable, I'm hopeful they'll let me support those towns. So I was just wondering strategy-wise if it would be in the long term, smarter to ask for 8,200 this year than rather than 3,000 this year, and then next year have to go go back and probably ask for twice as much. Yeah, I think though Heartland would be in shock if we ask for a ton of money. I think the answer would then be no. The people, you know, there's some people who don't know about the channel. And so I think it's my responsibility to make it clear. With the other um, towns, Weekly, I put on the listserv um, direct links to their meetings and also to some community event that has happened in their town or, or near their town that they might be interested in, and that's very successful. For some reason, your listserv won't let us do that. So, so I think there's a big miss. Oh. Like, like I'll film something over at Dartmouth, which would be have great interest to the Heartland community, but you'd never know it if you're not a frequenter of our website. So um, it would be delightful if I could. We're sort of like Vital Communities. So Vital Communities runs the other listserv. We're all about making community connections and being a, a, a sort of a digital platform. 
so that people can become informed. So, um, yeah. So is it safe to say that you expect to need 8,200 next year? I don't know. I don't, I don't know what's stuff. safe to, it, I, my obligation as the executive director is to figure out how to increase fundraising, to increase um, communication in the community to, to show the value that we have. I mean, the ideal nonprofit model would be like 30, 30, 30, 30 percent would come from you know, franchise fees, 30 would come from towns, 30 would come from nonprofits. I honestly think that's very unrealistic. I don't think the towns can support us that way. So um, I need to do some serious tap dancing to figure out how to turn us into a nonprofit. Can, can you tell us what Heartland's <coughs> number would be at 30 percent? At 30 percent? Oh, yeah, it's painful. Hold on a second. $10,896. Yeah. Yeah. So the question then to you is, is my service worth $10,896? Can I do it cheaper? I mean, these are, these are all questions that each town um, is thinking through and trying to figure out. And I would um, tell you that it's beyond government meetings that we provide services that are important to your, to your residents. So can you charge for um, some of those services you were talking about before? We can charge for them, but we find that that's pretty much against our mission. Uh, we could charge, um, t like Lebanon's going to ask us to create three voting videos, which we'll then um, charge them for. But to charge individuals for um, the education, the idea is we're trying to bring education to the people. A lot of disenfranchised people, there's people on disability, there's handicaps, there's elderly, and to charge for those services, it's just keeping that information from them. So if we can figure out a better funding model than charging individuals, to me that's the last, you know, the last possible option. We'll figure it out. I think what you're doing is is wonderful. I just I, I was looking at our figures today, and we have 22 organizations currently that ask the taxpayers for support, plus the fire department, plus the rec department or the rescue department, and um, I I don't know if people would be up for. I've had interesting conversations and in getting petitions signed. And there's some people who totally get our mission. And you know, the bottom line is, is it worth a cup of coffee to have government, local government transparency when you think about what the cost would be per household? Okay. You know, so. so maybe getting on the Heartland Listserv is, re is really key. I think that would help people understand the value of what we do. It, it, it's not a pitch for us. It's just, hey, we did this this week. You might be interested in this. And it keeps people more connected. And you don't know how much of Heartland is on. Like, we don't have cable at our house. It doesn't go to our house. So Yeah, it's funny. That's the thing I can't quite get out of Comcast. I can try to divide by numbers, um, but it really is contingent. It's complicated. It's contingent on how big of a package people have. So I can't tell whether it's... 5,000 people or 2,000 people I mean, it might with be, a lot of money. That know? might be the other thing where you wouldn't have as much support as maybe you deserve is if people can't actually see it. Right. You know? That's why we have the internet. No, oh, right, right, right. Yeah. Delivery. Yeah. right. So, delivery is different. So we yeah. deliver to all people who either have internet access oh, okay. and or I, uh, we had a videographer from Heartland and she doesn't have internet access so she goes to the library and she watches her website shows there. Okay, right. So, I forgot that part. Yeah, come Can in. you uh, come to town meeting and... I, I have to come town. to five town meetings. <laughs> so I will have somebody, if you'd like, I'd, I'd have somebody That's represent. That's more effective. Yeah. Um, I also would like to make two pleas. One of them is we would love board members from Heartland. So if anybody's watching this and would like to consider being a board member, I think it would be better represented. And, um, and please 
bring your mics closer to you. I got a lot of complaints when I was having petitions signed that they said they couldn't hear you. <laughs> is it, is like how close is close? Like, I don't know, as close as you can get it. <laughs> How's this? I push it. I would push it, it. It was a pervasive, <laughs> well, people get tired in the evening and they sit backwards yeah. and, uh, and there were quite a few people who had a lot to say about that, so people uh -huh. are watching, you know. Okay. Are we good? Gordon will do better. No. Yeah, it's, it, it was Gordon specifically. Yeah. Was it? It's okay, I can't hear him down here. Okay. Okay. I, I should tell you that we have Comcast cable to our house. Oh, do you? But we're not hitched on and probably never will be. So um, yeah. it's just how it is. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's just how it is. Well, we can get it on the internet if we want to. I, we, I'll just, just push that away. He'll just push it away. I'm not going to. Should I put a happy face on it? Just leave it right there. That's close enough. <laughs> okay. Um, so thank you very much. Yes, thank you very much and, for coming in. And, and, uh, and, yeah. and I yeah. urge you to make sure that you or someone is at town meeting because yeah. that's where it's really going to count. Okay. If you have any questions in the interim, please feel free to call. Okay. Okay. Yep. Okay. So we're going to go over the current uh, standing on our budget. Is that budget? You're going to go, I'm, um, yeah. Yeah. That's the numbers. Can we rent out the north part? Four months through the budget, we're at 35 percent. Mm -hmm. uh, appropriations, um, I paid most of them throughout the year for the year, except the fire department and the rescue squad. I only paid half. In assessments, we've had a lot of payments that we have to pay yearly, right up front. So if we back those out, it'll bring us down to about 35 percent. So we're we're right on track through the end of October. As far as the expenses um, in the general fund side, uh, you will see we paid off the 21 house. So that shows as an expense of 100 and sorry, Assessments, you'll see the expense of $149,580, but the revenues are on the other side. So we deposited $166,226.97. I didn't see that. The revenues are on a different sheet. I know, I know. That's what page is that on? Page two. general fund we're, we're right on track for uh, our expenses through the, month, through the four months. The highway department is um, below budget at this point. Um, obviously when we get into the summer we'll have more subcontracting and more road work to do so that will, will come up some but at this point it's at 25% um, uh, through the end of October. <coughs> In the winter budget, uh, we just started doing the winter time, November 5th, for payroll and the changes for the upcoming months. So that will start to increase. And the summer budget will, will go down, will stay the same over the next few months. Do I have questions? Do you have questions? Yes, I do. All right, Mary. <laughs> so on the revenue of page one, uh, it says uh, activity center electric, $2,400. How could there be revenue from that? What's that mean? So they, they have their own Green Mountain Power account, but Martinsville Hydro also bills the town. So we bill them and they pay us that. 
And that's considered revenue? Yes. Even though it's probably just a wash, right? It is just a wash, okay. you're correct. Okay. And then, um, I think it's on the same page, judicial fines, it says 8500 There's no way we're going to get $8,500, right? Well, the state's having a problem at this point. So they changed softwares back in the end of April. And it's not talking properly with another software, with the judicial, or with the, the rest of the state. Uh -huh. So I called three weeks ago to find out, because we haven't been paid for May, June, July, August, September, or October. Okay. I finally got to the right person, and they promised me two weeks ago that we would get paid. We haven't been paid yet, so I got to call her tomorrow and find out if they ran into another glitch. So we may get closer to that this year, because our contract price per month has gone up. So I think the police have spent more time in town than they did last year. They have more people. Okay, so did she tell you what it might be? No. But you no. think it, it will get up? I think we'll, okay. right. Because what's going to happen now is we're going to pick up May and June that should have been in the last fiscal year, yeah. and it's going to be in this fiscal year. Oh. So we'll have two months extra pick up this year. It's, so then on page nine of, uh, uh, it says all home day expenses, it budgeted, so the expenses were budgeted for 10000 but. It's thirty-four dollars and fifty-one cents listed. So that that won't hit until the next fiscal year because we usually get the expenses in June. Oh. So that'll hit this fiscal year. We'll we'll get some more. We'll get the bills in June because they they like to be paid on the fourth. So we'll have them oh. processed in June so the checks are ready for July fourth when. Oh, the expenses okay, come okay. So this. The fiscal year 20 will pay for fiscal year 21, June, yeah. July 4th. Yeah, so period 12, that, that expense line will go up. Okay, okay, okay. That's it. Thank you. You're welcome. Matt, Matt is here. He needs to have some stuff. So what you're saying is all is going well. All is going well. We are percolating nice and evenly. And yeah. Yes. Great. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you, Mark. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Mark. So the auditors, as you know, were in, in July and they came back in September. Um, they've got most of it wrapped up. Uh, they emailed me today and said things look really good. Um, they're happy with what's going on in the finance office. They turned it over to John Mudgett today or tomorrow. They're going to turn it over. Tyler helped Brian wrap it up. So we should hopefully have a, a, a preliminary here in the next five, six days. But they so, said things so look good. Are you saying they're, they don't have any major findings and just no. tweaks? Okay. Just tweaks, yes. Yeah, no major findings. That's great. Yeah. yeah. So that's that's really nice. Yeah. <coughs> we haven't heard of any yet, anyways. No, we haven't heard of any yet, anyway. No, no, because compared to the last couple of years, that's great. Roger, did you come to uh, represent the Snowmobile Club? No. So, let us know what you what you've decided or what you're thinking. Okay. Well, um, well I, should, this, this I should. I just somebody should say what what it's about. I mean. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so this was started by Yvonne, who I guess approached David about getting a load of fill or putting a load of fill by the activity center where we cross in four corners as we come to the road. It's kind of a pretty sharp uphill and not real safe to get up into the road. If we were a little higher, it would be safer and a better access to it. But it's land that the town owns and owns the road, so we wouldn't want to put any fill there or do anything to it without, without your blessing. And she also asked about 
maybe a load of, of when you're cleaning ditches to be dropped there. Probably not a good idea this time of year because it might freeze before we got there and got it leveled out. So if it were okay, we would put a load or two there ourselves. Um, maybe this fall if we could arrange to have it done and graded out. And, and you know, if you happen to have a load and we hadn't done it by next year, that would be fine in the summer. But we just didn't want to try to fatten out that shoulder right in that one spot without getting permission. So where's this coming from, this so Where's the fill coming from? Oh, we would get something from Dow's if we did it. If, if you have a load uh, from cleaning ditches that you wanted to dump there, but it, like I say, this time of year, there's a good chance it would freeze, and you're probably not doing ditches this time of year, so. Okay. The location is right across from Peter uh, No. Gregory, Gregory, yeah. Yeah. And um, it does go right onto Well, how about then mowing? How is that? It kind of feathers out on the side. We have the same situation We're across from George Little's house, and we put some fill there, and that always gets mowed and taken cleaned up. So oh. mm -hmm. that had been filled out there. It's the same same kind of thing. It was okay. steep coming up to it. I don't remember when that was done, but Roger, I'm just curious. I can't remember because. I haven't computed, my son hasn't computed, but where does the Vermont 50 cross the road there? Where does what? The Vermont 50 miler. I don't know, I don't know. They cross that through the free elongation of the line. Okay, so it's not the same place. Yeah. With it. Yeah. Okay. So Roger, I assume that the question of mowing, um, that at some point after this fill is put there, that it'll get smoothed out and rocks picked out of it and so forth. Is that right? Mm -hmm. By the snowmobile club, it's not yep. just going to be dump and run. Yeah, I mean, it would probably, if it's dows, it probably would be overburdened type of fill without much for rock in it. Yeah, yeah. If it's from your ditches, it might have rocks in it. That's what I was thinking. Yeah, it might have a lot of rocks. I think they're really conscientious. I think that the Snowmobile Club yeah. is very concerned about things. And, and they wouldn't dump and run, is my point. I didn't get all that, but. <laughs> oh, you didn't hear it? No. Oh, um, I, d I think that the Snowmobile Club is conscientious and would, would not do a dump and run. You know, that they yeah. would make sure everything is the way yes. it should be. Certainly. Yeah, but I was just thinking of Tim. Tim uh, mows our lawn. Yeah, so, I mean, he right. mows that with his mm -hmm. with his mower. We'd He's certainly leave it so it's mowable there. I yeah. Guess. Maybe not with a riding lawnmower, but certainly with a with a flail mower or something like that. Well, that's. I mean, he does use a riding lawnmower. Yeah. So. Roger, Roger, last year. Um, so, I'm changing the topic. I'm sorry. Um, <coughs> You were using a section of Webster Road, mm -hmm. and, and I'm wondering if that's going to that's be off on the trail or on yeah. the road this year. We're continuing with that. Assume that it's okay to do that. We had, I think, one complaint last year, and we put up some more signs there. And it doesn't get a lot of use down there anyway, yeah. but it does sort of tie the vast system together a little bit better. Mm -hmm. Good. Do we need a motion? It says, yeah, we do. No, I think we are. We are okay with this. I am. Yeah. Yeah. It's I think we don't have any objections, Roger. Sounds like a. <coughs> hopefully, make it safer for the. Thank you. Yeah. No. Thanks, Roger. Okay. <coughs> Well, Dave, I guess you're on. I'll get the lights. Let me bring my glasses. Uh-oh. 
I need distance. The distance, yeah. You know, I actually got them in the car. I might as well go get them. Why don't you go get them? You see better. I'm going to read it on here. Thanks, Dave. <coughs> Dave, is everything up there on here? Yeah. Oh. Uh, more in here. I'm going to let them. We have to stand next week but it's kind of more general. Uh they're gonna have to go over on the screen. It's all one of the same. This is so tiny. Yeah. So I can see this okay. Talking more or less about some of this as we've been going along uh, the last four, six months, I'd say. I'm kind of off and on in, in sporadic conversation about different things. Um, so a lot of what we talk about or what we see tonight shouldn't be overly surprising. Um, and I'll also say that uh, it's almost literally Groundhog Day. This year's budget is a lot like last year's budget. Again, you're gonna see most of the activity in the highway fund uh, and um, minimal activity in the general fund, uh, although I will get into the general fund. Uh, and then we'll go over the tax rate and I'm gonna do most of, uh, or some of the explanation at the end um, and go through the budget as it is um, pretty well up front. Uh, what you have here is the uh, overall picture of the proposed general fund. And I will literally state that uh, we kind of came crashing into this. Um, we had a fair amount on our plates, or at least I had a lot on my plate. I know that uh, some of the crew did uh, as well. So I will be taking um, a closer look at this as we go over the next couple of weeks. We will be discussing this again next week as well. Um, however, I expect, uh, at least from a proposal point of view, unless um, there's significant feedback from the board, there may be some tweaks, but I don't expect anything huge as far as you know, big changes that can be made. I think some may be here and there, um, but I don't expect you know, that huge places that we can change and, and take a different direction. General fund, uh, again, this is an overall picture. Uh, the far right column is the proposed fiscal year 2021 budget. Uh, this is up 3.18%. Uh, last year it was essentially a zero, it was a minus a little bit. Uh, we have got, uh, most of our activity is in the assessment or the total assessment, and I'll get into some of these in just a few moments. Uh, from an administrative point of view, um, a couple of things, one or two things. Appropriations is a um, difference this year. We've got three or, or at least two new appropriations and two that are asking for more money. Uh, the library is up this year. They are going to present next week. I will let them talk about the details. Uh, however, I do know that um, one particular driver in the public library is uh, health insurance. Uh, one of the employees picked up, uh, went from kind of a, a single or a couple to a family, uh, and that drove that up. 
about $7,000 actually. So uh, there is an increase, I'll let them discuss it, but um, that is health insurance. And then I'll get into the miscellaneous um, at the end on the general fund. But let me start uh, again. Uh, I'll go through these a little bit in detail. Uh, the administrative point uh, that I talked about is essentially the legal fees. We, coming off of the um, reappraisal, we felt last year uh, a need to budget higher. Uh, it is right here, legal professional. Um, again, we went from way back when I started, we had budgeted $7,000 for legal fees. That was actually for our audit. It was professional services, so we, in 2008, budgeted zero for legal fees. Uh, we slowly started to up that, uh, but you'll see that uh, 2019, we saw the first of um, a couple of appeals, one that was very active. And then we budgeted up to $50,000 for the reappraisal. We've backed off, but certainly not, um, certainly didn't come back to ground zero. A uh, couple of reasons for that. We're seeing activity across the board anyways. 2018, we had a lot of uh, expenses. However, some of that was due to the finance office uh, and some of the um, changes that we were going through there. And just like this year, where the appeals in the legal process bumped into July, I expect that the appeals from this BCA process that we're going through, and at the moment we have a minimum of four, uh, to probably possibly go into next fiscal year. So that would also um, incorporate a need for the legal fees, not to mention just the regular activity that we're seeing uh, out in town, whether it be the appraisals or those requesting us to take on new roads, that takes on legal significance. Or when you take on a house such as what we just have and we now own it, I expect that um, the Blake property and what's going on at Fort Brick Road may need some fight, uh, legal review at some point in time. So there is a consistent need for legal review for towns. I've seen it much higher in different towns. Granted, they're bigger towns, but um, I think that certainly where we were at a while back was zero. I'm not sure how we kind of got through that, but uh, again, uh, that's the movement that we see in the administration. Again, that's down $20,000. Uh, so we are essentially down um, in that department. Uh, assessments, uh, we had a jump, uh, it was actually, and we're behind a little bit, it was actually starting July 1st. Uh, our state police contract jumped from the mid 50s to about $64,000, so we're kind of behind here a little bit. Uh, I am shooting in the dark here because they haven't put together their numbers for next year. Uh, however, they were stagnant for a while and then they jumped. I'm hoping they stay somewhat stagnant again. Uh, but I have budgeted a little over what their contract states for this year, uh, for fiscal year 21. So you'll see an $11,000 or $9,000 jump there. Um, the benefit here is the Route 21 house has gone away. So we had 38 thousand nine hundred fifty dollars that was budgeted there for our yearly payments that was a five-year loan to pay that off that has gone away I originally when I was putting this budget together had penciled in twenty five thousand dollars there 
uh, and that was to start to pay back the capital projects fund for the uh, three corners intersection. Uh, we're still kind of withdrawing money out of the capital projects fund, but certainly felt as though it would be a benefit to start putting money back there. Um, and to also kind of put a placeholder on that expense line item as well, knowing that at some point in time we have that to pay off in a five year period of time. Uh, however, so that's a benefit to the assessment. I'm going to jump way down to the last one, the miscellaneous. What I have instead decided to do with the miscellaneous. Um, and again, it's a little bit of a wild card, but certainly I was up there last week. Um, and I have put that towards essentially scrap metal cleanup rate. Uh, whoops, I went too far, I'm sorry. Miscellaneous, I have penciled in the $25,000 there under junk vehicle cleanup. Because uh, I am unsure what the Forkbrook Road property is going to need. Uh, so we're literally kind of saving it from one issue, and now we have kind of a similar issue. Made sense to me to slide it over there. I certainly did not want to leave that as zero, um, although I do feel the compulsion, I guess, to. Um, and Martin and I have been spending some time talking about this and even Bill a little bit, and we hope to go up there this week. Uh, I, I think we're going to have to act on the mobile home that's up there sooner rather than later, um, preferably maybe in the spring, whether we can sell it or it's taken away or whether it just needs to go into a dumpster and kind of go away that way, which will be an expense. I do feel kind of the need to you know, kind of ease into this, um, see what we can, what needs to be done. There is certainly buried treasure there. How bad, I'm not sure. Um, maybe Spock st talk to Two Rivers, see what Brownsfield Grant can maybe do, but that's kind of identifying places. This has been kind of, I'm just not sure what's there. Maybe scope out who can do the work or what needs to be done is just a little bit of an unknown. However, um, I feel more comfortable sliding that down into that expense category uh, and using it there. Uh, certainly, I do know that without a doubt, whether it be legal expenses or getting rid of uh, certain things or having to act on it sooner rather than later, um, certainly feel as though there is going to be expenses with that property at some point. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna leave the library um, for them. They can kind of go over that. Appropriations. We just heard from CATV, right at where the, um, the little icon is. They're requesting 3,000. We have a new one here out of Queechee Health, out of Woodstock. I believe it's 2,500. They have a petition out, uh, although the big movers here, I shouldn't say movers isn't really the right word, but uh, the fire department um, is upping their operations budget to 70,000. Uh, I have talked to John Sanders quite a bit. Uh, Martin does their books, talked to him a little bit. Um, Bill is a lieutenant with the fire department. I'm certainly aware of uh, their budgetary needs, I would say that they're right on with the $70,000. Uh, however, um, it does affect the budget uh, if it is passed by the voters. I have this all in as if it will be passed. Uh, so you see an increase from the fire department uh, and certainly think uh, knowing that crew that um, it is as needed. I don't think they would be asking for it if they didn't need it. Uh, and then the other um, program that is asking for additional funds is the essentially aging in Heartland who oversees the community nurse program. Uh, and 
due to really the Merrick Campbell Fund and other activity that I tend to kind of come across, not to mention the working with the Mount Escutney Prevention Partnership Group uh, and some of the issues that uh, we've been working with them along with what John and Christine and I have been talking about. Uh, I've been getting involved in this area quite a bit and I have come to really respect the Aging and Heartland group and a lot of what they're doing. Uh, the outreach that they're doing, a lot of the cross, you know, communication that I end up having with them. Um, there was a meeting a week ago Friday, I don't think it was last Friday, the Friday before, with the community nurse. Uh, she was there, they talked about their program a little bit, they explained the increase and a lot of the increased needs that are out there um, and the feeling that they're just really kind of, I mean, there's more to do. Certainly, actually that's kind of not strong enough. The demand certainly is more than enough for them to utilize the additional funding. And I think everybody feels as though you hit that plateau and there's more for the community nurse and aging and heartland that um, can be done. They have become their own nonprofit. They have kind of detached, again, is a little bit of a strong word, but uh, they used to be kind of joined at the hip with Mount Escutney. They have gone more or less their own way, um, kind of acting more independently, although still very close with Mount Escutney. I think they're putting all the pieces in place. Um, again, I can't say enough about them, but certainly it affects our bottom line at the end of the day. <clears throat> so that is, um, those are kind of the big moves up and down for the general fund. Again, next week we'll go into each individual department in of itself. Kind of want to just put out a couple tidbits uh, in the budget. Um, there are some that kind of get um, some movement, but uh, there is a cost of living um, increase built into the budget. I do it every year. Uh, I've been accustomed to that. However, what I do for the cost of living, and the cost of living increase is different from what I would call a step increase. We don't have a step or we don't really have a formal policy as to, okay, the guy's been here, or she's been here four years, and then they bump up to another grade. Um, so that is done kind of subjectively or independently of the individual. But the employees get a cost of living increase for those that may not get an increase uh, in any particular year, uh, and that's simply for inflation. And I, that number for me comes off of the CPI New England Index. Uh, and that's 1.5% this year. It's actually lower than I thought. I thought it was going to be like a three point something percent increase. And um, the energy costs are actually surprisingly low, pulling that down a little bit. Um, but it is 1.5. So that is built into the budget. Also, we are anticipating there was a 10% increase from MVP this year. I think Blue Cross Blue Shield was more like 12 or 13% increase. We swapped to um, MVP last year, so it's a 10% increase. We have a 10% increase for this fiscal year, or actually for this calendar year, which affects the first part of our fiscal year. Um, I didn't say that, yeah. It affects the first part of our fiscal year in 2021. So we have budgeted a 10% increase into this budget. So it does affect both the general fund and the highway fund. Um, Did you say, when did you say the cost of living increase? 1.5%. So, so there's no merit, it's just a cost of living? That's just a strictly a, a cost of living increase. Just, um, And I'll go into some individuals. Again, we'll, we'll drill down to each individual department next. 
next week, um, this is kind of more of an overall view. Okay, highway department. Um, this was, uh, saw activity last year. Uh, we hired a buildings and grounds person last year. That I put into the um, highway department. Uh, traditionally, um, the uh, original or, or the prior buildings and grounds person kind of reported directly to Bob. Uh, I put, uh, Evan is the new person under Bill. Uh, since I've been here, and I think maybe the years prior, the highway crew and buildings and grounds, or buildings anyways, um, there was a lot of overlap between the two. I think that um, a lot of the highway guys did electrical work or septic work or whatever kind of needed to be done, so I felt as though that was a good fit. Uh, we also made some increases to some of the key components of the roads. Um, subcontracting went up, paving went up, materials went up. This year, I am proposing a new highway person, and I will get into this um, in a little bit once we go through the numbers um, as to the reasoning and the justification, but I do think that this has come up in enough meetings um, and certainly came up, uh, we haven't discussed it in detail, but the Roads Committee that uh, Phil and Gordon participated on was a large part of that conversation. Uh, so we, in this particular budget, are looking at a highway person, an additional highway person, which you will see um, drives the, essentially the highway, the top line there uh, under expenses, total highway administration. You'll see a jump there. Uh, so you'll see his health insurance come on. That's one of the big expenses of having an, an employee or an individual. We don't know who that person would be, so we have budgeted for the most, um, the, the, essentially the, the family uh, health plan. Uh, if this person would have a family, would be covered. Uh, and it also helps drive the um, you'll see, although not as big of an increase, the summer maintenance uh, increases here, and there's an increase to the winter maintenance, um, although the big driver on the winter maintenance is actually uh, winter salt. Um, so that is essentially a big driver to the highway budget. Uh, beyond that, we increased the paving budget uh, and you'll see it here, total paving and resurfacing. We went from 120 to 140. And I'll uh, pull some numbers out and remind everybody what we've done historically. But it looks a lot like this, 80, 80, and 80, kind of back 15 years on the 80. Uh, we are drastically behind on the paving. Uh, we did 170 last year. Uh, and. Um, it got us about 0.8 of a mile. So um, we need to, I felt as though with the highway person, the most important aspect of a road that we needed to tinker with was the paving. So you'll see that there. Um, and then again, a big driver other than the person, the new person's salary is winter maintenance, which is a $15,000 increase in winter sand. We budgeted. 35,000 last year, and we ended up spending 50 something thousand on salt. I'm sorry, salt. Um, I wouldn't go so high, but I don't have a warm, fuzzy feeling going into this season already. We've already had two kind of, you know, near misses type thing, and we're not even into the third week of, we're into the third week of November. We're supposed to get some, some, some ice tonight. So I'm a little weary of that. Do you have the gravel resurfacing? Um, is, that, is hard pack somewhere else? Uh, hard pack is in summer maintenance. We, it was confusing. We used to have hard pack in both line items. And we just basically said, you know what? We're really not using this line item like it was kind of intended. Uh, it was confusing, you know. We're buying hard pack, we're putting it on the roads, we're kind of putting it in the spring, we're kind of putting it in the summer. 
So we just kind of morphed it all into the summer maintenance and that's where you'll find hard pack. And I'll show you the details on that in a moment. But important, this was an impact last year and I know it was hard for a few people to grasp, but you'll see an 11.5% increase in the expenses. However, the tax rate increase is 17%. And that is because when we had the original movement in the budget, we utilized upwards to $90,000 of surplus to bring down the tax rate in that year overall. We used it for both the highway and the, the general fund. Mm -hmm. So we now have to wean off of that. We utilized half of it, another $45,000 last year. We used half. Um, again, we had, it was a 12.5% increase last year. We had like a 20-something percent tax rate increase because we went from the 90 to the 45. Same effect this year, although this year I did budget $15,000 of grants and aid revenue, which is conservative. Um, but at the moment, based upon the workload that we've got, I don't see us doing really any more ditching than just the one grant. Um, again, at the moment, we've got uh, paving to catch up on and, and concentrate, and we also have the um, culvert over on Mace Hill that is taking up a lot of attention at the moment as well. So um, that is why you go from the 11.58 to the 17.33. Uh, for a tax rate, at least for the highway fund. And again, that's not combined. Um, Phil, I'll just show you real quick. I'll take a moment since you asked. Uh, on the details, so here's the summer maintenance. Here's the hard pack. So we just, it was one line item and then they had another one down here. Um, under hard pack, and we just said the heck with it. 2019, we combined the two. Um, actually, we were kind of the way we expensed it was kind of similar as well. And then we upped it to 75 last year, and um, we are holding at 75. Um, again, I'll get into it in a little bit of time. But uh, Mary and Martha, and I'm going to save this conversation because the committee, the roads committee hasn't brought this to you and it would be premature for me to say anything official about with the committee. But there is an indication that some of these key components of the road, uh, the spending should be higher uh, on say paving or on ditching or on culverts. Uh, I have tried to stay in with that conversation and again a part of that conversation was a new person but um, uh, I really didn't touch much of those key indicators except for the paving so you'll see the the hard pack stay the same here there was also a fair amount of conversation regarding um, uh, let me see if I can find it here Uh, help me out, Bill. What have we been talking about as far as um, on the paving to keep the, the longevity there? Crack ceiling. The crack ceiling. So there's been a fair amount of discussion on some of the, the regular maintenance, uh, crack ceiling. The conservation committee um, has talked to us about tree cutting. Um, we've also got some other issues such as the guardrails. I, I know of one place in particular that's in need of uh, some guardrail work, so I upped that. Um, by a thousand dollars and I also upped the crack ceiling by a thousand dollars however I haven't touched any of those and I'm going to get into um, I, I may hold off for a moment but uh, I didn't get into much of that this budget year simply because we haven't been able to do it historically, at least since I've been here, and as far as I can tell, we haven't done crack ceiling since 2004. So we have not done a whole lot of tree cutting, 
And if you look at tree cutting in the budget, tree removal, uh, 2017, we budgeted eight grand. We did 850 worth here. Um, you know, we took down a big tree over at the, um, uh, the church on Station Road, so we used up $3,800, but again, not even close to the budgeted amount. We have done some cutting uh, this year over on Mace Hill Road, so that may go into uh, this number here, but we're not even utilizing the money that we have budgeted. So this is a number we need to get to, um, both on the tree removal, on the crack ceiling, you know, if we spend more than four grand, well then I think we can cover it out of another expense line item. I think we can, you know, we've got a surplus in the highway. I'm not compelled to budget any more until I feel comfortable that the highway crew has the ability to do all the things that we're asking them to do. Mm -hmm. And I'll get into that in a moment, but let me just tie up, bring it all together with the tax rate, and then I'll finish that discussion. So what does this all mean? So uh, again, it's very close to last year. From a budgetary point of view, um, we are up about $186,000 uh, or 6.48%. And that 186 is combined general fund and highway. Again, the big difference or the big jump here is in the highway. <clears throat> Excuse me. Translates to a 9.67% increase um, in combined for the general fund uh, and the highway fund, so that it would be the total town increase. Um, I would like to point out that on an assessed value of uh, $300,000, that translates into 145 bucks. On a $200,000 house, that is $97. And on a um, $250,000 house, it's So this was very big last year, and it is a good part of our problem. Uh, it's half of our problem. Um, it's basically what I talked about last year, is that historically, we have been consistently consistent. We have been the same. Again, uh, you go back eight years and uh, our gravel resurfacing uh, other than 2008 has been very consistent and a lot of times we haven't even utilized what we've budgeted. When I look at 2019, we went out and we brought a whole bunch in and we had a very good discussion as to how we were gonna utilize our surplus and we brought some in and we continue to do so and work on that. Paving, uh, this number is high because we actually did two years of paving uh, in one fiscal year. Uh, so that is going to mean that um, our, our expense for this year is gonna be light in that respect. But again, you know, all the way back to 2007 and even 2006 wasn't a whole lot better. Um, you know, for 12 years, we spent 80 grand. Um, simply, we weren't keeping up. The highway budget, again, mirrors everything. Uh, the only reason there's a jump here is because we brought basically all the highway wages and benefits and everything out of the general fund into the highway fund. Um, otherwise, this would be relatively stable up until about here, and then again, it still doesn't go very far. So we kept things very low. Um, we deferred a lot of things. 
And when that happens, it's got to catch up with you at some point. And that's what's happening. So again, this is the movement here of things out of the general fund into the highway fund. So you see kind of a steep increase there. Just so it happened to correspond with our last semi reappraisal. Uh, we have a little bit of a jump here, but you know, pretty stagnant here. And now it's like, okay, we need to start putting some money into the materials. Now I'll say, and it's just stuck with me, I, I put it out simply because it was a true lesson to me, but literally my third class, my freshman year in college, my professor is standing up there on a stage and we were talking about hotels and ski resorts and stuff like that because it was hospitality management. And again, very, very early on, he talked about deferred maintenance. And if you defer maintenance, it's gonna cost you twice as much when it comes time to fix it. I also have a good friend that is a highway department head um, with quite a bit of experience. He has told me the same thing. If you're gonna go a year without doing anything, it's gonna take you two to catch up, okay? And this is what we've got going on here. That's what we dwelled on last year. I'm gonna to add to that, it's half of our problem. And I was gonna make a nice little diagram and I had Doug bring up the board, but uh, I think that that's just gonna complicate it. I'll try and explain it as simply as I can. And that's simply to go back to the discussion of why I'm not putting money into crack sealing and tree cutting and guardrails, because I'm saying that I don't think we have the capability of doing that comes down to making sure that you've got the right manpower to do the job. So this past summer, Bill had surgery. We had another guy out with a knee. Summertime is times for vacation. There was days we had two guys. I mean, there's nothing you can do with, you know, these guys might as well just lock up shop and go home. I mean, there's little that you can do with two guys. Might be able to go out and clean out a couple of culverts, but that's kind of it. Um, not to mention that once you do get behind, you know, it would be one thing if we were kind of cruising along and we had been kind of spending all along and this was a little bit more of a diagonal going that way and you're actually on top of things and you're in a groove. Um, you know, maybe with the workforce that we have, that would be fine, but we didn't do that. So now we've got to, as I said, takes almost twice the effort to catch up. So to simply expect that this crew is going to handle what we're doing based upon a crew that we have had for as long as I have looked at budgets, which goes back quite a few years with Heartland, um, I think is unrealistic. The other thing is, is that we have had development. It has occurred. Um, the Cream Pot Roads, the Webster Roads, um, the Mount Hunger Roads are not just the two to three farmhouse roads that they used to be. They used to be, literally Webster Road used, didn't even, wasn't even there. Stopped at the farm down at the bottom there, it now goes all the way up. Literally goes over a farm. Um, yeah, that's a pretty steep hill and that causes us a lot of problems and causes a lot of focus to make sure that cars can get in and out of there. Um, you know, but that didn't exist 20 years ago. And the last or the other item I want to put in there is that historically, and I'm gonna talk about the town manager position here, has done a lot of different things. You know, he's been the health officer, he's in emergency management, um, he's the town manager, he was the highway guy, so to speak. Hiram spent time at the highway, Bob spent time at the highway. Um, you know, if you needed to call the high, you know, town manager, he was always there. Um, basically, he was capable of doing most things in town. Well, what, and I've talked to the board a lot about this, you know, the last 
seven years, we've been working on the same stuff. You know, it's tough to concentrate on the intersection when your culvert goes out and now you've got FEMA and you gotta get a RFP for the culvert. You got delinquent taxes, you got a mobile home you now own. You know, you got people I could literally just simply talk on the phone and answer emails all week. Um, somewhere along the line, the work needs to be spread out so that it can actually be done. So I'm not talking about you know, geez, I just want to spend more time having lunch, or I need to go over to Mike's more, or talk to Billy over at Bee Gees more. What I'm talking about is kind of delegating the work to appropriate places to have it get done. So a big component of that is the relationship with the highway department. And historically, again, the town manager's been very close to the highway department. Um, at this point, what I'm saying to the board is that the town manager needs to focus on the larger issues in town and delegate highway things to the highway department. It means Bill. And Bill can't arrange for ditching, he can't arrange for paving, he can't arrange for crack sealing, he can't arrange for trees to come down, he can't arrange for septic systems that need to be fixed that, oh, by the way, we're having problems with the septic system over the activity center. He can't um, respond to, you know, pilot lights being out in the, the oven downstairs and drive a truck and clean culverts, et cetera, at the same time. This doesn't work. It's just like I can't sit there and be on the phone with FEMA and being over there telling the highway crew which pothole to fill. It just doesn't work. Therefore, if we're going to be able to get to a point, Bill needs to delegate or give up the time in the truck, which he has essentially already done, which means we need to backfill his spot. So Bill is spending more and more time putting these pieces together. We need a highway person to pick up the slot, because otherwise, there's five over there. You take him out of the truck, there's only four, we're behind anyways, doing what five used to do, and the town manager. It's not going to get us into the future, it's not going to start knocking off that priority list. What it may do is simply get us day to day, okay, the phone gets answered, you know, we can respond to, you know, the, the, the woman that's car is, can't get out of, you know, the gully or whatever. We can do that, but can we start making progress on the ditching, the paving, the culverts? The answer is no. And that's where we need to make the progress. So that is why two things going on. We need to concentrate on those big road issues being the culverts, the material, the paving, and we have the burden of trying to get to a point where we have enough structure in town that the needs of the people are actually being met. And that's the story of this year's budget. Good job. Yeah. There you go. Just thinking on your little blue line up there. If you, if you switch that to a certain area of pavement that you can buy instead of dollars, that line would probably go down instead of being even level. Wait, say that again? I didn't understand. You, you haven't worked inflation into that. I, no, I haven't. So, so that line would actually go downhill. Correct. <laughs> Very, uh, yes. I think we're going to get more details uh, next week. So you can ask as many questions or save as many questions as you'd like. We're going to revisit this again next Monday and actually drill down to, you know, some of the individual departments a little bit more. You know, it'll be a little bit more, it'll be a little repetitive, but um, 
you know, we'll drill down to the departments a little bit, um, some movement there. The library will speak. And um, certainly you can ask any questions uh, or more questions at that point. You can digest this, take it home, look at it. <coughs> and then we'll need to discuss more on the third and or the second and the 18th, I think. So I do have questions. Okay. I, think it's okay. I do have questions. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So I'm wondering, we see now um, storm damage does not seem to be an aberration, but actually something that we can expect. So uh, you've got, you have three line items up there. One was for Hurricane Irene, another one was a 2013 storm, and then there was the municipal storm damage. So I'm just wondering if we should, instead of hoping that that's not gonna happen, we should just budget something anyway for it. Because um, there was nothing in those line items. So those line items are past revenue lines. So those were revenue that we received from past events. So Martin and I have been talking about, and I chose not to address that um, simply because um, one, I'd have to look into it. You may need a policy in order to carry it out is to put money in, and we talked about this in the past, essentially over budget your revenue so that your fund balance or your equity increases. So we, over the last two, three years, have had a deficit in the general fund. Mm -hmm. If you were capable of doing that, you can increase and go from a deficit to a surplus. Mm -hmm. And the... Finance Association of New England? Uh, the American Finance Association, or something to that effect, essentially uh, recommends a 15% fund of your, at least your general fund, if not your total budget. Oh, we did talk to about To have that. in essentially fund balance. Reserve. Yeah. For lack of a better term, but it's not in a reserve, it's actually extra fund balance, surplus monies, so that when a FEMA event occurs, you're capable of spending that down so that you don't need to borrow, or you can at least react, right. you know. Um, that is, you know, I've been kind of battling these increases the last couple of years, um, so I have felt the need to put the proper structural pieces into place before we tackle that. But certainly is not, is an idea that Martin has brought to the board a couple times in the past, mm -hmm. and is an idea, and Norwich has a policy on it and does it really well, mm -hmm. and their expenses from a FEMA event or two ago was so great that they went through that and then some, but certainly helped them buy time to do a lot of the initial work before they had to go out and get a line of credit and, and deal with it that way. Yeah. I forgot that we, we have yeah. talked about that. But it's certainly, certainly something that should be considered, if not now, at some point into the near future. So uh, secondly, I want to see, I would like to see a report from both the constable and the animal control officer. So they're, they're, they want more. And I, I don't actually know what they're doing. Uh, I can tell you for sure that the animal control officer could do, literally be out there almost every day. Um, we get, she gets calls, we get calls. There's constantly something on the listserv about a loose dog. A lost dog or a cat or something. And I actually, when she came on, said we need to limit that to true, yeah. you know, true needs, because it got to the point where people were literally calling in, and they still do, ah, you know, I got a dog in my yard, you know, can you come and, you know, fetch it away? Mm -hmm. 
So she is very selective and I think very helpful and um, does, I, I can vouch for her quite a bit. I think uh, some yeah, of- I'm not questioning that. Yeah, some, and we've made some of these movements you know, internally. James is more of a mileage thing, um, although we have seen a movement in his um, hours as well. And it's basically mostly on a Saturday. Okay. He works, I'll remind everybody that Kate is a mom with four kids, and James has a 40 an hour, you know, 40 hour plus job. That this is, you know, is not their prime focus. Right. Um, and then I question lowering legal fees from 50 to 30 thousand, considering we do have the Blake property, we do have Fort Brook Road, and four BCA appeals. I, I, I don't know that that's wise. To drop it? Yeah. <clears throat> um, again, I think that it's an educated guess, uh, just like the 50,000 was. Um, you know, I remember Phil asking me last year, you know, why 50? Um, and my response was, I, you know, based upon what we're seeing, it's a, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a guesstimate. Um, and I think that it is the same. I think we, I can say that we, guesstimated, uh, you know, I was hoping a little bit high, you know, who knows, you know, may not be, maybe not enough. But I uh, certainly felt as though maybe once we're past the reappraisal that that should come down a little bit. And again, that is, that's a guesstimate. I know, but we do, it, it, we do have these, this list of things that we know are, are gonna incur legal costs, so. Yep. Yeah, and, and Dave, I, I, I'm sure I can ask this, but don't we still have a third besides the one that Mary talked about that may be on its way to the Supreme Court? Say that again? Don't we have a third category that's on its way to the Supreme Court? It is. I'm not, you know, that's, that's factored into the 50. I totally expect maybe the, superior, the Supreme Court one to be dealt with in this fiscal year. Okay. Oh. Um, I do expect the 2019 appeal, so there's two, that's going on now to be part of that this year's fiscal year, because okay. there will be legal expenses preparing for that, yep. and it may very well go into fiscal year 21. Okay. All depends on how that moves. Me. Yep. Um, at this point, there's actually six appeals. Oh, So there could be so more. Does that um, uh, make the um, possibility of legal fees less less when, it, when they use the state auditor than the court? Um, I believe that. So I believe that a lawyer will still be involved. Typically, we need not as much, but I think we have um, at this point perhaps one or two that would benefit us to have the benefit of a lawyer. It's not. A What is the alternative to the Superior Court? Um, to, after the BCA, uh, you know, if I'm not happy with the BCA decision as a landlord, you can 
go to Superior Court or go to the state auditor. So the state auditor, there are several uh, very experienced ministers um, in different towns around that have had some initial training and they represent the state and here. They tend to be very knowledgeable about uh, lister uh, laws and stuff, more so than certain uh, than judges necessarily, mm -hmm. because this is very focused. So it's, uh, it's still legally binding and all that kind of stuff, but it's, uh, it's just not going through that court system. So unfortunately, like February, we may have a better idea as to how that $50,000 number matches up. Um, but this will be to print in January mm -hmm. um, with town meeting in March. So this is a guess. My recommendation would be if the board feels as though that is too conservative, um, Certainly, the board can make a recommendation to up that upon adoption of the budget. How, how much of that 50 is right now is left? I don't have the number right. Uh, uh, we've utilized 8,300. 8, is remaining. No, we've that's utilized 8,300. We, we've used, utilized that. So there's a lot of money left. And, okay. That makes sense. Uh, I have more questions. Does anybody else want to? Uh, no, go for it. Okay. okay. So why do you think the Blake property is a brownfield? Um, because at the foot of that hill yeah. is a graveyard of excavators and cars and other types of material and then there is an embankment that goes up to his his house which that material tends to as you can see remnants of it in the ground as you go up to the house and as you get to the house there's a plateau above it that above that plateau has a very old junked rusted out trailer a very old junked rusted out boat very old rusted out remnants of a lot of pieces and then in this plateau coming up from the ground, you can see pieces of something um, with a burned, you know, something was, you know, somebody burned something there. This is the same resident that Chief Sanders responded to with an illegal burn with the town of Woodstock, that there was multiple items um, being burnt, including a hot tub. So there is tires still there and other materials going down to the brook. So it is, um, I again, it, the, the $25,000 is again a little bit of a crapshoot. It could be certainly cost the town more, but then again, if we kind of ease into this and, and and digest it and, and take careful steps. Next fiscal year may not cost 25000 Ultimately, I think there will be a cost here. Um, Martin has pointed out in our discussions that we do have surplus remaining from the sale of the 21 house. <coughs> so that perhaps if we move on some of this in the springtime, it may alleviate the burden into next fiscal year. But I you know, we're getting into snow and other things. I think it's a matter of taking some time to go up there, taking some time to go with maybe the proper people and say, okay, what do we got? Mm -hmm. Or maybe just sticking a for sale sign out there and say, you know, to the best bidder, just beware, you know, something's, you know, just take a look. Um, you know, it's yours for a price. Uh, I don't know really where to go with that other than, um, <clears throat> that's a number kind of like the legal expenses that eh, you know is it higher than that seems high and lower that doesn't doesn't seem to be quite right those are two items that you know if if we had more of a history on the legal expenses you know certainly with the reappraisal and 
being more stringent on the roads and you know other things that we're tackling with the delinquent taxes has um, created a reaction and it's been a legal necessity to kind of defend ourselves on that um, where I don't think we crossed that road in the recent past anyways so you know I don't have a whole lot of you know looking back for guidance so it's kind of you know some gut feeling talking with Martin and Bill and kind of inching forward on it yeah I'm not questioning the amount I'm just I, I was questioning the description of it yeah as a brownfield so um, did aging in Heartland get a new nurse did I think they? she's been there for about under a year maybe uh, Sarah Koblinski might know but uh, she's I thought they were just looking for one Recently. Yeah, so she, uh, she, Kate, I think, is the nurse that, um, but I don't know if it was like. They do. That was like a three quarters of a year is, ago, anyways. Yeah. Um, she's on, she's going to go out on maternity leave, the, our town nurse. Yeah. yeah. And, I think and for. she's overbooked. Uh, <laughs> Two. All right, so then uh, ash tree, so the tree removal thing you were talking about. Yeah. We got to start planning on taking Sky's out. Sky's the limit on that one. Yeah. You know, so here's, again, I'm going to come back to, um, I have not as aggressively as, uh, Rob Andrag or, or some of the other folks on the Conservation Committee. I have been watching this. Um, ultimately, it's, you know, what is our ability to react? And unfortunately, the answer is pretty darn little. Um, you know, so we can spend a whole lot of time and Bill's time bringing in somebody to cut a lot, which actually needs to be done. Um, but we've also got some pressing needs on some culverts and some ditching and some paving that needs to compete with that. So as I just was talking about our, our personnel needs, um, it's not something we've been able to really get out and do well enough in the past. So I think that you know, if we approve this budget, we can't bring on another person until July 1st of next year, which mm -hmm. is halfway through our, you know, construction season. Mm -hmm. So it's just a matter of, you know, do we budget it for wishful thinking? Or if we get there and are capable of doing it and we actually cut, you know, even 12 grand, which is $4,000 over the eight, I feel relatively comfortable we can probably manage that somehow within the budget. You know, I, I at a 10% increase, I'm I don't feel compelled at this point to say, okay, let's budget for 12 grand and we do another three grand. You know, it, you're right. We need to do this, but my answer to almost all of this is we need to do it all. You know, we need to tackle the trees, but I'm going to argue that at the moment the asphalt and the ditching and the culverts are more of a priority than the trees. I think that we can probably, to be honest with you, if they start dropping, I, you know, I, I kind of want to laugh, but it's, it's what we got now. You know, we've got a lot of dead trees out there. Um, I get con con phone calls a lot about dead trees. When we have the ability to cut, then by all means, we'll cut. I mean, I, Mary, I'll add that the Roads Committee is, has developed a, a proposed budget, and, and you'll see it soon, as soon as I can get finished writing. Um, but there's some drivers in that budget which we are required to maintain our roads, uh, especially those that have the hydraulic segments on them um, and slope. Um, and Two Rivers has worked, and Bill has worked with Two Rivers to identify those those segments. And with the budget that we see today, it's going to be ten years before we get it all done, unless we increase the budget. Um, so I I, I I don't have those numbers exactly, but um, 
So uh, I think just to back what Dave is saying, uh, I'll advocate for the roads and for the municipal resource work that had, you know came up Saturday. Um, but there's 20 other polls at the same time, so I'm not really sure you know, what's going on. To, and let me just clarify that. The, the problem literally is, is that we can't go from zero to 60, you know, overnight. Right? We can't, you know, I've got people, you know, and it's actually a problem with almost everything, you know. So I got people, I got the conservation committee saying, what about the trees, you know, and I've got... What about the uh, You know, somebody, you know, I got another group of people, you know, the residents saying, you know, what about these roads? What about this paved road? And I got this group over here talking about, you know, how come you haven't ditched in a while? Unfortunately, we're at a point where all of that needs to be done. You know, so it's a matter of, you know, really making sure that we can walk before we try and run, you know. So I guess what I'm saying here is, is you know, just by even not even putting any money into the ditching or the hard pack or the culverts and just picking the pavement. I have basically made a choice that we need the pieces in place being a new person to enable us to get to more of these things. Mm -hmm. So kind of a, you know, let's kind of get from here to there before we can, you know, take on the whole, which is, you know, but we still need to, you know, we still need to do all of the above, you know, but we're going to prioritize this, this, and this, and then as we get this structure in place, we are going to pick up the slack and do that, that, and that. Okay. About the trees. <clears throat> uh, I think sooner or later, hopefully it's a lot later, one of these trees is going to land on a car. There are a lot of dead trees hanging over the road maybe broken off and just leaning into another tree. I know of several right in my own neighborhood. And I'm not so sure we should ignore those. We should so, talk to Mike, Mike Willis sometime. Yep. He had one fall right on the hood of his truck because he was driving Woodstock. Ooh. So was it in Heartland? No, it was in Woodstock. Yes, my point in, in, in yeah. this is going to sting a little bit, but uh, let me be perfectly blunt here. But the dead trees were there 15 years ago. Oh, I know. And we, you know, if I go back to that spending, we didn't do anything. We didn't spend more. We didn't say, oh, we haven't done any crack ceiling since 2004. You didn't say, geez, we haven't spent the five grand on trees. You didn't say, oh, by the way, we're so far behind on paving that 80 grand isn't going to make it. You know, so we can't just wake up and say, geez, now we got to get out of those trees and fix it. Well, I just, had a, I just had a conversation with Bill the other day, and we're talking about this budget and the expectations going forward if we get a new person. And you both come around to the fact that there's so much to do, it's almost like, you know, which direction do you go? So it comes back to identifying the, pri you know, all that needs to be done, put it up on a wall, pick those priorities, which we have essentially, myself in communicating with this roads committee saying, first and foremost, we need a decent road, which is the asphalt, the materials, the ditching, the culverts. We need to put that in place, which a lot of that is subcontracting, but we can't do that because it takes my time or it takes Bill's time. So we need to free somebody up to do that which should hopefully help us free up the time to do the culverts, which should help free up time to do other things, the tree cutting in you know, the fall and the spring, and maybe give Bill the time to actually call Ted Knox and say, look, we've got you know, 10 trees we gotta take out here. You know, I could spend 100 grand on trees on Quichi Road alone. I mean, go out towards, you know, Draper Road, you know, there's a whole mile segment that's so overgrown and people call and they're like, geez, you know, you haven't dropped any salt or you haven't plowed on Queechee Road. Oh, heck, I just saw the truck go out a half hour ago. Well, it's so shaded and it's so icy that, and so rutted that it's like, you know, the plow's missing half of it and the trees are shading it, you know, so the product is, 
less than stellar, and they come back and say, hey, highway crew, how come you're not out doing your job? And it's like, well, they are, but you know, we're capable of only doing so much, so we gotta take this in bite-sized chunks. So, you know, tree could fall on Damon Hall, Martinsville Bridge tomorrow. You know, which ones are gonna be? I don't know, so we gotta go out and selectively cut and start doing that, but we can't do that unless we have the pieces in place. Okay, so I have one other thing to bring up. So you were there, several of these people were at the breakfast yesterday. Yep. I was there, I was there. Um, the, I just wanna read it, make sure I get it right here, the Heartland Municipal Resource Impact Working Group. And they have a recommendation, which also costs money. And I don't know how far we should go with that, whether we should put um, that something we should put in the budget or um, what we should do. But the idea of having part-time, maybe, person to follow through on <coughs> our ordinances yep. and uh, see that they get uh, followed. Yep. And I know we have not heard from the League of Cities and Towns as far as the, the proposed new ordinance. And that'll take some yep. time. But, uh, yep, I agree with all of the above, uh, although I'm gonna come back to um, bite-sized chunks. Um, so one, Two Rivers out of Quichi is still working on a draft ordinance of which they won't start until maybe mid-December. Um, so the thought process here is a lot like the trees and a lot of things that we're dealing with. We cannot just go out and do this all at once, unfortunately. Um, it is going to need to take place in steps. That's why I talked about going into this explanation of where we are at and kind of a defense of the budget, talking about how last year we have got expenditures and materials that we need to increase, but as we move along here, that's only half the problem. The other half the problem that we're dealing with here in Heartland is putting the pieces into place so that myself, John, Doug, Bill, and Martin can do what needs to be done, along with Clyde and, and anybody else involved. Um, so that would, we would need to look at next fiscal budget. Um, and I think that, uh, again, it is going to be a look a lot like this budget. Oh, that, that would be in a general fund expense, and we'll probably be looking at a lot of the same discussion as to why we would need a ordinance enforcement person or a building ordinance person. And again, we're talking about delegating responsibility so somebody has the ability to focus on that and get it done. Again, this is something that um, was on Bob's plate and um, Bob actually uh, did it better than I. You know, we, 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 you know, the Hall's, you know, Mr. Hall's house and Mr. Coley's house. But again, I'm going to point out that we had Mr. Coley, we had the 21 house, and now we have Forkbrook Road. Um, I have talked a lot about the expenses that that causes for the town. Uh, whether we like it or not, or whether we want to understand how that is, and that delegating that ability to focus on some of that isn't gonna make those issues go away. I mean, people have been having scrap metal yards in Heartland since the beginning of time, so you can't just change things with a part-time person, but we will be having the discussion next year about why we would need to do that, which I think was outlined very well by that group, but is also making sure that the pieces are in place so that it can be carried out. And um, I would say that it's important for us to get the highway person in place, understand and put the ordinance together and make sure that the town feels good about that ordinance. And everybody I, I, at that breakfast, there was a lot of discussion about what would be in it what would be covered, what would, you know, what kind of change would have to happen with the resident before, you know, they would need that. So I think a lot of that needs to be fleshed out. 
um, answer those questions, and that's going to take us into spring anyways, um, and come back around and, and be ready to talk about that next year. So um, as far as budgeting, you're suggesting that go in the 22 budget. Correct. You know, I just wonder, uh, you know, I, I think that you could start out small with that, with that thing by possibly having someone, a retired person, or someone who could work no more than one day a week and have something like, in the budget, something between fifteen and twenty thousand dollars. And if we were to put that in there, that money would be there if we did get our act together quicker than a year and a half from now, but rather a half a year. Um, I will, if Sarah wants to respond, I'll let her respond. sort of three lines of thought quickly off the top of my head. One is I think that we experienced um, an unexpected level of understanding and sense of urgency from the 68 people who chose to be at the breakfast on Saturday. Mm -hmm. Second thing is I think the working group itself has come to understand that the processes of municipal government are slow and that they can take some time to work through if you're going to do things solidly and well and be sure that you've buttoned up every edge on everything and are in full compliance with everything that could impact something new you do in town. And, and that has to be done carefully if it's going to stand the test of time. So then the third piece would be, if you put those two together, to really move ahead in the incremental way that Dave is talking about makes a lot of sense. But to perhaps put some kind of placeholder in the budget that's a message back to the community that they have been heard is also really meaningful. So to, and then use part of that, you, still understand it's going to take probably another year of work to be in the right place, but to give an indication that select board wants the work to continue could be a really meaningful message. Yeah, well, I'd, I would say we talk about having a reserve fund for a lot of things, and this would be a pretty small amount compared to a percentage of the highway, of the highway budget, for instance, for a storm. Um, this would be a rather easy thing to do compared to that. Yeah. Um, and we, we know that the uh, Building notification ordinance is, um, is is coming down the pike. I mean, we haven't seen a draft. Um, we 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 would have to see it. We would have to work with it, uh, and so on. But we do have another 12 or 13 ordinances on the books today. So, possibly, Gordon, your idea of of uh, uh, a part-time, no benefits position. Yeah. That would be the placeholder that would um, uh, meet one of Sarah's points of community, we heard you, and we're moving in this direction. Um, uh, could be a nice first step. And I, I, I would say that I totally agree with Sarah, because I have been running this thing back and forth through my mind, thinking about, and I really like the, the way you worded it, but I'm trying to think that is there any possibility we have any way to enforce this this new ordinance? And it's just so out there that we really don't have any good 
I don't think we have any good answers yet. I, I am left with that sinking anxiety of the unknown about the Blake property. You know, um, you know I think we, we, I would love to say let's turn it over, but I'm afraid until we really know what, what's there, there's not going to be much we can do about it. So, um, as from a budget perspective, I just hope that's enough. Yep. It could be very, very well just be what's in the immediate area, and if that's you know yep. remediated, then um, you know that would be beneficial. Right. But it's um, yeah, it's just an unknown. Right. You know, it could be nothing, and it could be a headache. Okay, Dave. I think we heard from all the commissions and committees uh, for for budgeting, but did we have we heard from the cemetery committee? Or are they going to possibly come back and? And, and say we have more trees that are going to come down in the cemetery. So I've heard everything from zero to 4,000. Okay. So there is $3,750 budgeted. More or less 2,000. More or less 4,000, close to 4,000. No, I just understand that. I just, the numbers that must be in your head can be. Uh, well, actually we budgeted 3,500, so I split the difference. Okay. I'd like to say this is all really scientific and the number actually, you know, a lot of it is. And some of it is kind of like, okay, so-and-so told me this. I heard it from this and right. this is what it was. So right. this is what I've got for now. Okay. And there's some time here to, as long as it's not a major adjustment, um, you know, outside of the, the two or three that I've heard tonight, which would <coughs> have an effect. But, uh, you know, something $250 is not. Yeah. It's not an issue for me. And any in indication what the school is going to do? They meet tonight, I think. Right now. Right now. And they've got, they've got a little bit of eye cords, right? What's the town doing? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that doesn't. Although we have too much. A, little, a little effect on the whole thing. But That's time. right. Yeah. No, it's just as a taxpayer, I'm interested. Oh, I want to have coffee with Gordon and Scott tomorrow and your son tomorrow morning. <laughs> <laughs> well, Dave, thank you. It, You're welcome. It's uh, very thorough. Thank you to the crew for showing up to. Yes, thank you very much. Appreciate it. And then Dave, you want to talk about the, the appropriation of the fire department? You said. Uh, yes, and uh, to John, and I, I forgot to ask Martin, uh, I think maybe Martin were working on kind of a nice sheet on the budget, but um, I've got Bill and, and Martin to vouch, but um, so I don't know if in recent history the fire department has petitioned to be on for the appropriation or not. Um, this year it is close to a $7,000 increase. So last year it was a couple hundred bucks and I asked the board, would you like them to petition or not? And the answer was now, a couple hundred bucks. Uh, the policy for appropriations is if it's an increase over the year before, that the, that the entity needs to petition. somebody prior to that. Um, so I put it to the select board that that is the policy that we seem to have followed for the last two, although I think that there is an understanding that this is kind of a consistent 
um, being the fire department and um, a consistent need <coughs> and is described very well each year by the fire chief uh, and as to whether um, the time by these folks uh, to petition um, whether the board would like them to go through that or not. I would say yes. And it's tough to start making exceptions. I think it would be a good idea. Okay. Myself. Sounds good. I have to express one irritation I do have with the fire department. Um, I want them. So I, my understanding is in other towns in the area, they have fundraisers of one kind or another. So I don't expect Heartland Fire Department to do that. They're all volunteers. They all have jobs elsewhere, families, blah, blah, blah. But I do think that they could gather the insurance information from the accidents that they respond to on 91, like other towns do. And I, I'm not sure why there historically has been reluctance to do that. I'm not on the fire department, obviously, so maybe there's, I don't know, maybe there's, but don't you get the information from the state police? No, no you, you can get money, is my understanding. The fire department that responds to accidents on 91 can get money, like reimbursement. And, and other towns do that, and it helps fund their fire department. So in lieu of uh, you know, fundraisers, which are onerous, and I understand all that, there is an opportunity to get money uh, I know that sounds crass, but um, uh, other other towns do it, and I I think maybe it's kind of expected. Well, this is a fine line that's really really you know I'm saying to the last. But I will say that if you start charging on people's insurance for car accidents, what happens if they're locals? They want they're already paying uh, the taxes for this, and he wants to charge them as well. Or do we pick and choose on who we charge and who we don't charge? That, that's some of the d debate on, on doing that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do we just charge out of state? Do we just charge uh, out of Windsor County or out of Heartland? Or wh which, one do you, which ones do we do? Or do we just charge everybody? Because there's quite a few Heartland residents that actually get in accidents on the interstate, too. Mm -hmm. So would they be willing to be okay with that also and also paying for our budget? So what, what's the downside of... of uh Insurance uh, providing a, a little revenue to the fire department. I mean, What's the downside? Yeah. Well, perhaps people's insurance rates will go up, and they may not like that. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, I just wonder if they would. I, I, I don't know. I don't know that. Do you know that they would? I, I don't know for sure, but I. Yeah. But don't they go up if anyway if, if, if you have an accident? So. Yeah. Not necessarily. Yeah. That's just a little yeah. small part of it, paying the fire department. Yeah. I was going to ask Ms. O'Brien, um, you'd you indicated. Call me married, Sarah. Okay, Mary. Uh, that other communities um, use this mechanism. Mm -hmm. um, are you aware of any in particular that could be pursued for information about how they navigate issues like that and well, how they? I, I don't. I don't know that. I mean, historically, they have not wanted to do it. So, uh, is there any point in? Talking to any other towns? Okay, so it would just need to be a research project first to get a, a framework. I think so. Okay. I think it's Hartford and Windsor. I think it's an unknown. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think I anecdotally they haven't wanted to do it, but, you know, I, I don't know that they. I don't know. I'll, I'll just make the simple observation that Thank you. both Hartford and Windsor are full time and have at least a staff of 10. Uh, on uh, on their payroll, um, I worked in Norwich that just had a fire chief. Um,
kind of like what happens here, uh, although Hanover was a little bit more aggressive in that if they didn't get a bill, you know, if they billed and the people didn't pay, you know, it was on the town. And we hired out to a collection agency with very, very little success. That's not to say that calling the fire insurance or calling the, the insurance companies and, and tracking them down. Uh, having dealt with full time uh, full time fire chief and a volunteer, it is going to take an effort to make the phone call, follow up, make sure it happens, provide the information that I'm not entirely sure that I, I'm stuck on the word structure, but not sure that's there. Um, and as a town manager, I can probably send another little warning shot over your bow, although Chief Sanders doesn't like to talk about this, and I'm sure Lieutenant Barrows doesn't want to talk about this either, but they are all mostly over 50 years old. Uh, on any given day, if there's something that happens in Heartland, if we can get one of them to show up, it is a blessing, and that is usually John Dumas, who is retired. Uh, although the fast squad does respond a little bit more consistently. Um, so it is something that, again, from a long-term view, you know, we're talking about the insurance today, but five, ten years from now, we may want to be talking about what are we going to do about a fire department, period. Okay. Sorry. I'm Sorry, throw it out off. there. I'll take it back. That's okay. Let's get me back to those two little typos here. <laughs> I'll keep that to myself. Uh, on that note, I didn't mention that um, John Sanders and I have been talking about a generator for the fire department. And um, I didn't pull it up. I can do that next week. Uh, we feel as though there is room to take that out of the fire department equipment fund. Um, and put that as an article and move towards getting a generator for the fire department, which would also power the highway department, which would solve um, some issues if we had a prolonged power outage um, for the fire department and the highway crew. Well, don't we also need a generator for someplace else that's going to be a shelter? And we already decided that the fire department wouldn't work as a shelter because it's in the flood zone, right? So we talked about the school, but apparently to qualify as a shelter, you have to have a shower, blah, blah, blah. It can't just be a generator. So the showers and the bathrooms poses a problem for most anything in town. Um, my answer to that is that we have a... So what if they have to stay dirty? No, no, I, I think we have a. By definition, you have to have a shower available, right? Did we learn that? We have a local hazard mitigation plan that needs to be renewed over the next year. <coughs> mm -hmm. I think you may have served on the last one. You are free to serve on this one. Your, your grandfather <laughs> did. Uh, <laughs> that question may come up. Um, we have designated the uh, National Red Cross um, when they open it in Hartford as our uh, shelter in the uh -huh. past. And I think that same plan back in 2013 mentioned the need for the fire department to have a generator just so that they can respond. So we can pick up the discussion from there as we write this one. Um, Great. I could use someone to like chair that effort. What? <laughs> <laughs> Might be pushing that a little far, but uh, just toss it out there. Well, we could have two generators in town, one at the fire department and one at the school. The school has one? Yes. So then it, the only reason that we're not, that can't be our shelter is because there's no shower. There is a shower at the school in the nurse's office. Oh, so one. then... Shower. It's, un it's unclear as to how much the generator would power. I've heard it would power the necessity. Like it's, I don't think they went and got a big one to power the entire school or, or the gym. And Sarah or Martin, I think, may have been on the board at that point in time or whatever. That's just 
I have not had a direct conversation with my Cal or anybody over at the school as to what the thing actually powers, but I heard that it it will do the you know the necessities of keeping that heat and maybe some emergency lighting on. I'm not sure if it does more than Martha might be able to tell me. I think you're right. I think it's heat and water and fuel yeah. So we need to be upgraded. Not to say that it's a you know it's an obstacle but can't be a few lights without system. Well I don't know. I'm not saying I'm looking for the Taj Mahal or you know canopy peds over there, but uh, I'm just going by what I remember that they had certain requirements to you know to qualify. So that's all I got. Did you want to say anything about your notes? Or we're all set. Oh, I just important things in there. I think the most important thing is the uh, steps. Uh, I did meet with uh, Dave Joslin. Um, the feeling I got, we talked a little bit about how this would be accomplished and the, the cost <coughs> estimate for the front steps would essentially stay as is and the cost savings would be to the additional work here since he's already mobilized. Um, so he would be here set up, same cost for him to do the steps, but since he's already here, any cost that would be to get here or to mobilize, you'd simply be moving down the road, um, kind of goes away. So the savings would be, you know, cumulatively, but, you know, would be to this project here. Uh, he told me he would get me an estimate on that, uh, so I'm waiting to see that. Uh, whether we do that, we've got the money earmarked for this year for close to 25. Um, at this point, meeting him personally, talking over the work, I feel very strong about this candidate. Uh, I think he is, uh, speaking with Chris Cole, the engineer, certainly qualified to do it. I think my recommendation or question to the board ultimately is whether we want to do it as one and do the front steps or put the two together. And which would mean that we would need to do that you know, unless, you know, probably next fiscal year when we've got additional monies budgeted for, can, for that. Can we carry the monies into the next fiscal year? What's that? Can we carry the step monies for the rec center? Not really. It's not apples to apples. We could. Yeah. It's not. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, at this point, what you've got working for you is the ultimately the surplus from the 21 house um, that's going to assure, but we've got. We'll know, we'll have a clearer picture when we get the audit numbers back. Right. But I think what's important to note is that in governmental accounting, you budget for the year. So you raise money for what you're gonna expend. It's for a one year period of time. You expend it during that year. If you have essentially, not too unlike a business, to, if you have anything left over uh, or under, that carries over essentially into your equity. So right now we're carrying a deficit. So that money would kind of get carried into a deficit. So it wouldn't necessarily mean that you've got 25 grand that just pops up on the other side and says, here I am. Right. Um, you know, it needs to kind of go through that. I have slept on this a little bit and I would need to talk to the, um, the auditors as to whether we could establish a reserve fund for the front steps with the unused money. Mm -hmm and then earmark that, essentially expend it to the reserve fund, yep. and then therefore it pops up, you know, come July 1st. Yep. But I, I need to feel comfortable with that and understand that that's something that is, is a logical step for us to do. And then, and then I think that that would, that would essentially hold that and we would be able to utilize, to pull it out of reserves next yep. Yep. fiscal year. Yeah, and, and th th this, Contractor is primarily a specialist in the steps and reconstructing those concrete columns and so on and so forth. But at the same time, we have other concrete work that we have to do around here. So if we start there, you know, should we bud try to budget for the walkway patches or replacement? So 
There's tripping hazards. You know, I'm going to come back to, you know, we've also got, again, I'm going to come back to the painting of the, uh, the library that we've, we pulled clapboard off and we put back on. And, and maybe okay. Evan can do some of that work. And I'm worried about um, the ADA access for, I'm, for John. You know, with I, I'm happy to hear that feedback because it, it was just a short time ago that I said, you know, look, you've got to do more than just that section of roofing. You've got to do the entire roof. But at the end of the day, we can literally connect the dots to almost everything. So there needs to be some discipline here. Sure. Um, so I'm kind of looking at, you know, we earmarked money and told the public that we would do the front steps of the rec center. Yeah. Um, we may be able to pull that into, um, you know, next fiscal year and do the steps to Damon Hall, which makes some sense. Uh, you know, outside of that, we're starting to get into a whole other project and another right, issue in another area. I think we should stay on top um, of the Damon Hall because I so, looked at them on the way in tonight and the cracks are there. They've been surface patched a few times, so it's only going to get worse. You're just a Dave Downer. You I, you know, Anything I that we propose, I, I, you no, know, no, no, no. On Saturdays, I'm really not get, that. Get I'm, really, I'm a little out, more right? upbeat. <laughs> you know, huh? Get your checkbook out. <laughs> yeah. So, Dave, I have a question about this carrying over from year budget to budget because the same thing applies to the legal fees that may or may not be spent considerable amount of money and and the, and the uh, appeals that are coming up may fall into the budget we're talking about now are we going to be able to utilize the, the leftover so in here, I'm going to pull in the discipline where we've gone from one subject to multiple. So I'm going to come back to the governmental accounting that you, you tell the public what you're going to spend, you raise the money to do that, and then you spend it. If you have money left over, the intent is that you give that back to the, to the, to the, to the taxpayer. If you don't, and you end up with a deficit, what you're, one of the mechanisms, one of two, is that the following year, you raise the money from the taxpayer to cover the deficit. So you don't go multiple years. Now, we had a deficit that we felt the zone could be ironed out over a couple of years, and the auditors didn't want us to simply go out and raise a fair amount of money on the, on the backs of the taxpayer on one year. But governmental accounting truly is meant to be, look, townspeople, this is what we're going to spend. I want to raise this amount of money. We're going to spend it. If we don't, it comes back to you. Now, that gets a little silly because, you know, it goes back and then we ask for it again back and it goes back and forth. But um, I think that we would run afoul if we started doing that with multiple accounts. I think that, uh, again, I'm, I'm feeling with, you know, I wanted to set up a, 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 a buildings fund reserve account, you know, a while back anyways and actually in last year's budget, there is like $4,500 extra that if we didn't spend, um, I had put on the budget would go to an HVAC fund for the library. And I had another 4,500 that if we didn't spend would go to like a building fund. So the concept was kind of there. I'm, I'm relatively a little bit more comfortable with that, but you start to stray when you say, okay, we didn't spend the the, the, the law, law money, so we're going to stick that in reserve. Or we didn't spend this, we're going to stick that in reserve. Um, more often than not, except for this year, we're actually, un, you know, have overspent and we've, we're looking at, you know, where are we going to find the money? So if you start putting money away and you've got a deficit to begin with, you're just essentially borrowing money from yourself to put it away. And, you know, so um, I'm going to come back to staying somewhat disciplined and sticking to that concept. No, no, Again, you know, no, no. right after karate practice and we go to breakfast and all that, you know, it's a lot of fun. I'm a lot more upbeat and, you know, the sun is shining and, you know. So we should talk to you then. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> Sunday morning, you know. <laughs> Saturday night, watch of football, it's always fun. Yeah, hey, be careful. Sitting around talking about Tom Kennedy stories can be good. <laughs> May as well start talking about politics or talking sports. Um, Dave, can I ask a favor? When you are talking and writing about the Mace Hill culvert, I, I found myself, intellectually, I knew where it was because I just drove past it. But I don't want people to think we're changing any of the work that we did on Mace Hill 
this year. So just clarify where the location is. Um, so if it's in my packet or perhaps, you know, written articles, um, I don't know what Heather ended up putting in, but I yeah, no, try and spend exactly. a fair amount of time. Yeah, and I assume you have it, and the RFP is a no-brainer, I'm sure it's there, but, uh, but since there's a possible detour coming in yep. the nine yards, I think people should know more about that. And we'll be a little bit more aggressive once we feel comfortable with, yeah. you know, that we will be getting cooperation from the state on that, and, it's, right. and coming in a timely manner and and moving on with that. Um, when you're talking to our local state guys, can you see if they ever fix their um, traffic display, the the speed limit display cart? Because I think we could still use that in town in a few places. That's why we have it. Huh? Because it's broken? Yeah, yeah I think they came back and said it was junk. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we took a look and it was, you know, back behind six pieces. And, and if you look in their yard now, there's a whole bunch of them, but I'm sure they're all used for state projects. But, uh. so, um, I think we're nearly done here. Anything special? Anything more, Mary? Does anyone here have anything I want to say? Can we leave? Dave, did, or, or, or Gordon, there was one thing in the packet, this internet. Yeah, Just an FYI? I think so. I didn't okay. get that. Here. Okay. If it's not important. Okay. spend like 38 seconds. Uh, one last, this is off the top, but so I went to a uh, town managers association, city managers and town managers association meeting about a week and a half ago. Yeah. <clears throat> the city of Montpelier has been using electronic packages now for the last 10 years. They have not sent out a pay per packet in 10 years. Well, they probably have an email server, so everyone has their own email account, and they probably have a document storage system, so you can sort of look at them without going to CATV. So, what are you trying to tell us, Dave? We're getting like eight, nine, ten, eleven months into the electronic packet. You know, at some point, yeah. it's just a thought. You know, like the other cord cutters and. Valley, you may want to the paper back yep. I can't believe he has it. I mean, that's just so hard to do. <laughs> he told me last week, he's like, I didn't get the pack until Monday morning. I, you know, wasn't until the next day I remembered. I'm like, geez, I sent out the electronic file on Thursday. That's okay. Ah, so this is for your benefit. So we you understand it's, that it's, everybody it's, has different technological yeah. abilities. So, I, you know, <laughs> wants me. There we I go. figured I would just <laughs> want some needs. That's what I like. I would just poke the bear. I like paper. <laughs> We're just getting crampy. <laughs> it's getting late. Yeah. Um, who are the who are the six people that are appearing? Do you know? So do you what's know? what's going on outside? Can you look? Does it look like anything's going on? 